Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. Eternal life, that is. Just remember, Odyssey and Rumble. This Bible study is going to be on the color white. So, let's get started here. Now, there is a disease called leprosy, where somebody's skin can turn the color of cotton or snow. And uh, well, I'm not talking about snow up in the Northeast, like New York City, where it's a dark color. No, I'm talking about a uh, white, like um, a piece of paper or cotton or, uh, yeah, or uh, snow in the mountains tops, you know, where there's no pollution. Now, leprosy was a nasty disease. People's digits, I mean, as in fingers and toes, could just fall off. Can you imagine that? You've got a stub of a hand with no fingers because you had leprosy and all your fingers fell off. They just rot and fall off. It was a nasty disease. In the book of Leviticus, if somebody had leprosy, they were to go to the priest. And this is where the, the idea of quarantine came from. It came, quarantine came from the Bible. A lot of health stuff came from the Bible, believe it or not. And uh, it was an extremely contagious disease, from what I understand. And they would set them outside the camp. And uh, they would diagnose them and then tell them, you got to go away from the camp so everybody else doesn't get infected. That's what quarantine is, right? And, um, and then they would, if it cleared up, you know, maybe the Lord healed you or false alarm or I don't know. But the, the priest would declare you as clean, as in non-leprous. Jesus even healed somebody of leprosy. And he told them to go to the priest, be pronounced clean, and give the priest the gift that Moses commanded. And... I believe that's in the book of Leviticus. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, in the 1950s, from what I understand, there was a leper colony in the United States. It was in Louisiana somewhere on some island. Now, if you're interested, you can look it up. I don't really care the name of the island and all this stuff. But there was about, oh, I don't know, four dozen, maybe 50 some odd cases of leprosy in the entire country. In the entire country, there was maybe 50 or less than 100 leprosy cases in the entire United States, North America. Well, when they started letting the Haitians come to America, there was more cases than that in just Miami-Dade County. And, yeah, Dade County is Miami. Uh, there was more than 50 cases just in Miami-Dade alone from all the Haitians. Now, Haiti is the land of, well, you've heard of voodoo? Yeah, voodoo. Voodoo dolls, you know, you take a voodoo doll and... Uh, put a curse on it and get a piece strand of somebody's hair and you attach it to the doll and then you stick voodoo pins in it and yeah, that that's voodoo. Uh, also, that's where the idea of zombies comes from. Uh, the living dead. Yeah, Haiti. Haiti is one of the only countries in the world where leprosy is prevalent. Yeah. But in the Old Testament, sometimes people were 
struck with leprosy as a curse from God for punishment. There was a woman named Miriam. Perhaps you've heard of her. She was a prophetess. She was the sister of Moses and Aaron. Yeah, that Moses. And um, she was complaining about Moses' choice for a wife. I suspect that uh, she was of Japheth, not, not Miriam, but the wife material. Uh, supposedly, she came from Ethiopia. Now, just because the Bible says somebody's from Ethiopia, people will automatically say, oh, she was black. It doesn't mean anything. If I told you I was from Harlem, and I was living in Harlem in the 1920s, it was almost all white. Yeah, seriously. Harlem in the 20s was all white. You go to Harlem today, it's all black, almost, except for some Spanish that live there. Uh, you know, <laughs> does that make, uh, you know, uh, if you lived in Miami in the 40s, there wasn't much Spanish spoken there. But today, Spanish is the number one language in Miami. English is the second language of Miami. And I'm not joking around. I'm not kidding. It really is. English is the second language of Miami. Yeah. So, but she was from Ethiopia. It doesn't say anything about her skin color. But Miriam was un, uh, displeased with his choice of a wife after his first wife died. And I suspect she was of Japheth. Uh, but that's my guess. Maybe she was of Ham. I don't know. But either way, she was not of Shem is my guess. Does her being from Ethiopia prove she's black? No. Does me being from Miami prove that I'm a Cuban? No. No, it doesn't. Uh, I Cuban, I mean, there's just sections of Miami that are just almost 100% Cubans. So, you know, and like I say, Harlem in the 1920s was almost all white. And it's not today. It's mostly black. And, uh, South Africa, uh, 50 years, well, maybe 75 years ago, it was uh, mostly white. Well, it's not anymore. So if I tell somebody, oh, I'm from South Africa, does that mean I'm black? No. So Haiti has a lot of leprosy and they're coming to America. And oh, by the way, they don't quarantine uh, people with leprosy anymore. They did in the 50s, but they don't anymore. So, so Miriam was, uh, the Lord struck Miriam with uh, leprosy. I forget for how many days or a week or maybe it was two weeks. I don't know, but she, she had to quarantine herself and uh, she didn't say anything anymore. So with that in mind, leprosy turns your skin bleached white, like a piece of paper, like a piece of cotton. And uh, I mean, like a cotton ball that you'd pull out of a aspirin bottle. You know, no coloring, just pure white, white as snow. That was, uh, that was a bad thing. So, with that in mind, let's see what the Bible says about the color white. Oh. Um, there was a woman that was invited to a wedding. She was sitting in the pew in the church. And the groom is in his black tuxedo up, on, up at the front with the minister. And the bride is walking down the aisle in her beautiful flowing white dress. And mom's sitting there with 
her daughter on one side and her young daughter on one side and her young son on the other side. So, groom's in his black tuxedo, the bride is in her white wedding gown, walking down the aisle. And the little girl tugs on her mommy's dress and says, Mommy, why is the bride wear white? And the mother says, Oh, honey, white is a symbol of purity and it's the happiest day of this the bride's life. Little boy pipes up and he goes, Why is the groom wearing black? Yeah. You can figure that one out for yourself, right? I know. Don't, uh, I'm not going to be giving uh, Eddie Murphy any um, competition for comedy, right? So. All right. So. Let's go. I'm skipping all the leprosy verses in the Bible. So we're going to go to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is generally uh, attributed to Solomon, who was considered the wisest man in Bible knowledge, anyways, the wisest man who ever lived up to the point where in Christ was incarnated in human flesh. And if you don't know it, Christ was God come in human flesh. So, All right, so let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and we'll start in verse 7. Now, when Solomon talks about vanity, um, you ever heard the expression, he's so vain, or, you know, vanity? Uh, matter of fact, uh, don't women sometimes have what they call vanities? It's a little makeup a place for them to apply all their makeup stuff and they has a mirror there with lighting and all that uh, to be vain or vanity means to be wor worthless useless worthless if somebody's concerned about their looks outward looks and not their inward now when uh, generally maybe not always because I'm not an expert on uh, Solomon but generally when Solomon's talking about vanity he's talking about our his life here on earth well his and other people's because let's face it you could be the most beautiful person you could have the most money uh, fame everything you could have you could have it all on this earth well guess what eventually you die and then if you built a, a ranch or a farm or a whatever, whose is it going to be when you're dead? So everything you did was for nothing. It was vanity. The things that you store up for here on earth will come to nothing, come to naught, of no use. So that's why Christ said to store up your treasures in heaven, you know, giving to the poor, um, those type of things. Because our life on this earth is vanity. It's worthless. Once you die, you got nothing, buddy. All right, so Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 7. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white. White signifies purity. Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity. 
which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life. For that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Now, remember something, people. Uh, I did a Bible study on Abraham's bosom the rich man and Lazarus you got to remember until Christ went uh, died you know three days that changed the world I did another video on that Christ went to hell for three days there was a special compartment in hell where the Saints went Abraham Isaac Jacob um, E, uh, e Elias, or not Elias, but uh, not Elijah, but Elias, the um, his his uh, student, uh, Adam, Eve, Seth, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They all went to a special compartment in hell. It was the uh, non-smoking section, I guess you could say. You know, the non-flaming part. And Lazarus was there too. But the rich man was in the flames. Yeah. So Christ went to hell for three days and three nights, the heart of the earth. And he preached the gospel to all the saints of the Old Testament. And then they believed. And then they went with him to paradise. And they're there now, awaiting their new resurrected bodies. Yeah, that's a whole study in and of itself. And if anybody's interested, uh, well, you can, you know, leave me a comment. And hopefully, uh, Tube will uh, forward the comment to me. Sometimes I don't get notification of comments, so I try to answer everybody. I really do. I try. Uh, but I can point out, I'll find the video and post the link so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm not just making this stuff up. But when you die, prior to um, Christ's resurrection, what was going on on the earth? We had no knowledge of it. We would be in Abraham's bosom. We didn't know what our grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren were doing. No idea. So, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is the portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. You ever heard of the expression, every dog has its day? And sometimes chance just, uh, well, maybe it's the Lord's hand, I don't know. But sometimes chance happens. For man also knoweth not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net and as the birds that are caught in the snare you know, a net, a, a, you know, so. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. The wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me, 
There was a little city and few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, Wisdom is better than strength. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge of the Lord, people. Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than wisdom of war. Uh, wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one sinner destroyeth much good. What does the Bible say? That a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? One sinner tolerated in a church can destroy it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. All right, let's take a look at the book. Song of Solomon, Chapter 5. This might actually be a multi-part series. I don't know. We're going to read the whole chapter starting in verse 1. This is, a, um, this is a love story. You know, the thing is, um, it's kind of like um, relating, in a way, it's kind of relating to the Lord's love towards his people Israel and if you think Israel is a bunch of antichrists over in the Middle East well you're uh, we have an expression in America called uh, you're barking up the wrong tree you know like if you were a hunter and you had a hunting dog and um, the dog was barking up an empty tree well, the hunter is going to be looking for his prey in the empty tree. So, barking up an empty tree. Yeah. Verse 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1. I am coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh. Ah, didn't Jesus say he was the, uh, he stood at the door and knocked, and whoever would uh, answer that he would come in and sup with them and he with them, he with thee. Well, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. Are you going to answer? Or are you going to say, come back later, I'm busy. I almost did that. Yeah, what an idiot. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my, my locks with the drops of the night. And we're not talking about master locks or door locks. No, no, no. We're talking about uh, locks of hair. You ever heard of somebody cutting a lock of hair? Oh, yeah. That's what they're talking about. Verse 3. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. Well, that probably is the lock of a door, but yeah. 
I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called, but he gave me no answer. You know, you think about people. This is like God's dealing with Israel. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. You ever heard the expression, love sick? Oh, yeah. Verse 9. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women. Fairest among women? What does fairest mean? Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Oh, Snow White. Snow White. Yeah, remember that Disney movie? What color is snow? Snow white. Oh, yeah. She's the fairest of them all. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, that thou dost so charge us? Verse 10. Listen to this carefully. Listen carefully. My beloved is white and ruddy. Uh, okay. He doesn't have leprosy. And what is ruddy? Ruddy means having a reddish complexion and sometimes refers to freckles. You know, people, women put, uh, don't women put rouge on their cheeks to have nice ruddy cheeks, reddish colored. Uh, what skin color people can show blood through their skin. Ruddy has reference to being able to blush. So does the word Adam. Did you know Adam's a racial description in the Hebrew? It is. Of course, the publishers have been changing all that in the new lexicons. My beloved is white and ruddy. All right, let's take a look at Webster, you know, Webster, the dictionary guy, his 1828 dictionary. I have so much respect for this. Uh, Webster was absolutely a believer, and he uses Bible references in his dictionary definitions a lot. He'll take it right out of the Bible and stick it in his definition. But not only that, he was what was called a linguist, which is a language scholar. He knew over 20 different languages fluently. He could go to Europe, well, he did, from what I understand, and virtually any color country he went to, he could speak the language fluently. I mean, he knew Latin, uh, Greek, Hebrew, which are, well, Greek and Hebrew are the two Bible languages. Hebrew for the Old, Greek for the New Testament. And, I mean, he knew Latin. He knew, well, obviously English. He knew German. Uh, I think French. Uh, I mean, he knew where all the, all the root words for all the languages, where they came from, their meaning. Uh, you know, it took him a long time to put this dictionary together. And you know what? He didn't really make any money on it. That was not his, um, that wasn't his goal. So let's read, ruddy, adjective, of a red color, of a lively flesh color, or the color of the human skin in high health. Thus we say, ready, ready cheeks, ruddy lips. Uh, what color do people put on their lips? Well, not if you're a goth. You know, they put black lipstick on, but don't women put red lipstick on, you know, ruddy lips, 
a ruddy face or a skin, a ruddy youth or in pathetic language, ruddy fruit. What would be a ruddy fruit? Apples. But the word is chiefly applied to the human skin. That is right out of Webster's 1828 dictionary. All right, let's go back to Song of Solomon 510. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. When somebody with uh, white skin goes out in the sun, don't they say, oh, he's got a golden tan? Oh, yeah. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His locks. Are we talking about master locks? Schlag? No. No. We're talking about the locks of his hair. His hair was black. Black as a raven. 12. His eyes are as the dyes of doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem." Okay, there you go. Let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1. I did an entire commentary series on the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is like a mini Bible. It's like a single book that parallels or mirrors the entire Bible. Guess how many chapters Isaiah has? 66. Guess how many books are in the Bible? 66. Uh, the first half of Isaiah is judgment upon a wicked people and nation. The last part of Isaiah is God's mercy and reconciliation. What do you think the gospel was? Isaiah, people, it is such a neglected book in the Bible. It really is. It's a wonderful book. People should read it. So, with that in mind, let's read Isaiah chapter 1. The vision of Isaiah. Uh, and oh, by the way, according to legend, Isaiah, they didn't like the message of Isaiah, so they stuck him inside a hollow log and then took a saw and cut him in half. Uh, yeah. Don't like the messenger? I mean, I, I don't like the message? Kill the messenger. But that just makes the Lord even more angry. And Isaiah should be read in conjunction with Jeremiah. Jeremiah is depressing. It really is. And people, I think, the European Union, the UK, and the USSA are basically in where Jeremiah, Jerusalem was in the days of Jeremiah. But, hey, what do I know? Just one guy's opinion that's read the Bible once, maybe twice, you know. I don't know. Isaiah 1.1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children. They have rebelled against me. Yep, the Lord brought up children, and we rebelled against him. Verse 3, The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation. 
a people laden with iniquity. What is iniquity? Gross sin and evil. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel into, unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. It is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Is not the West, America, the UK, and the EU overrun with heathen aliens? Absolutely. But the country isn't quite yet desolate, and the cities have not yet been burned with fire, but that's coming. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. It is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Eight. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah, a very small remnant. Now this is what you call parallelism. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Did you know that God likens wicked, evil Jerusalem unto Sodom and Gomorrah? What? But Chaplain Ball, I was told that that's the holy city. Well, there maybe there was in a time past. In Revelation 11, 8, the Bible records, now this is talking about the two witnesses that confront the false prophet and the beast, and their dead bodies, the two witnesses, shall lie in the street of the great city, the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. What did God do to Sodom? Destroyed it in a plague of fire, fire and brimstone falling down from the sky, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. The Bible never says anything good about Egypt that I can find. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? Oh, if you listen to the Seventh-day Adventists, They'll say, oh, Rome, Rome crucified Jesus. No, no, no. Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. And then they'll say, well, he was crucified outside of Jerusalem. But whether, whether it was inside the city or outside the city, Jesus, the closest city where Jesus was crucified was Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. I don't know about you, but my Lord is Jesus, and he was crucified in or by Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Ah, okay. Oh, okay, Chaplain Bob, I get the point. Okay. So, Isaiah 1.9, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. See, the Lord is likening Jerusalem to Sodom. Because Sodom doesn't exist anymore. It was burned. It was destroyed. So how could they be rulers of Sodom? 
It's called parallelism, people. Ye, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our Lord, ye people of Gomorrah. God is likening Judah and Israel to Sodom and Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Where were the sacrifices to the Lord made? In the temple in Jerusalem. To what is the purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain, worthless, vain oblations. Sacrifices, right? Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. See, these people were so evil that when they were assembling uh, supposedly for the Lord, it was a den of vipers and evildoers. Verse 14. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. God was, you know, their little festivals and what have you, they were just dens of iniquity. Listen to this, 15. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. No, they're not. You're, the hands are not full of blood from blood sacrifice. Their hands are full of blood from murder, murdering people. You remember that uh, in the Ten Commandments, "Thou shall not kill." Well, they didn't. They didn't believe that stuff. So here it is. They're breaking God's commandments. They're full of murder, and lies and deceit and evil. And yet they go to the temple and worship the Lord. Yeah, sounds like a lot of Baptist churches I know. Oh, wait, I went to Baptist Bible College. Six years. I got a master's degree. That's why I pick on the Baptists. So, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Oh, yeah, they're going to pray. Oh, Lord, we got drought. Please send us rain. I'm not going to hear you. Clowns, your hands are full of murder. Verse 16. Wash you. Make you clean. You know, people, what did John the Baptist do? He baptized people. He got their flesh wet. It was symbolic. The washing of the flesh. Uh, it, it was basically, you know, what do you do in water? You know, you take a bath, right? The washing of the flesh. You wash the dirt off your flesh. But it was symbolic of washing the wickedness out of our spiritual lives. So, wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. How do you do that? Reading God's word. And don't be just hearers of the word. Be doers of the word. Verse 17. Do you, learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Listen to this carefully. Verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, what color is scarlet? It's kind of a reddish color, right? 
though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait, that's right. This Bible study is about white. Yeah. White's the symbol of purity, right? Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You ever seen white wool? I have. If ye be willing and obedient, there's that big if, if ye be willing, if you want to do it and you're obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Why? Because the Lord will bless your crops. He'll send you rain in due season. Ye shall eat the good of the land. Do you know the children, do you know that Cain in Genesis 4 was cursed? The land would not yield her strength unto him? Yeah. I wonder if there's a group of people in the world today that are never farmers. Hmm. But that's another, well, actually I did a Bible study on that. Remember, people, I'm on Odyssey and Rumble because I don't know how long I'm going to be here. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. You'll be destroyed with war. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. How is the faithful city becoming harlot? Jerusalem was the faithful city. Now it's a harlot. What's a harlot? It's an old English word for a whore. Yeah. It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it. But now, murderers. In the days of David the king... Jerusalem was full of judgment and righteousness lived there. But now, when at the day, in the days of Isaiah, murderers. Thy silver is become dross. What is dross? It's a metallurgy, uh, a metalworking term. When you mine silver out of the ground, you don't get pure silver. No, you got to heat it up. And because silver is heavy, it'll sink to the bottom and the dross, the impurities will float to the top and then you scrape them off. And you do that a few times until you get 99.99% pure silver. But the dross is the stuff you throw away. It's worthless. It's the impurities. Thy silver has become dross thy wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious, the companion of thieves. Sounds like Washington, D.C. or Berlin or Paris or any other, yeah, you, or London, yeah. Prince Charles, anybody? Thy princes are rebellious, the companions and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth Gifts. What are they talking about? Gifts. Bribery. You know, you go to the judge, you give him a bribe. Uh, uh, this person's got a good case, uh, but I want you to rule in our favor and ignore all the evidence against us. Here's $10,000. Oh, okay. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. Are we God's friend in love? Or are we evil and God's enemies? Big deal. 
there. And I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. You know, tin looks like uh, silver, but it's not valuable like silver. You want to get rid of it. If, you, if you're trying to purify the silver, you want to get rid of all the tin. Verse 26. And I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Well, that ain't going to be happen until Christ returns in glory. Jerusalem, the city of righteousness, the faithful city. And by the way, people, do you know what the legal definition of a dollar is? Now, I'm speaking to people in the United States. But this also applies to, um, well, not directly, but um, in the UK, you had a pound sterling. It was a pound of sterling silver, which is like almost pure. A pound is 12 troy ounces. So what was a pound? A pound was 12 troy ounces of sterling silver. But what is the definition of a dollar? It was one ounce of 90% pure silver. Now we have green pieces of paper that says dollar on it. But that's not a dollar. It's just a piece of paper with a picture of a president on it that says dollar on it. Or dollars. But I remember when we had silver dimes, silver quarters, silver do half dollars, silver dollars. And there was a time when we had $20 gold pieces. One ounce of, uh, well, I don't know what the purity was of the gold, but it was an ounce of uh, probably about 90% gold. $20 gold coin, yeah, in the 1920s. 1934, the government took them out of, made them illegal for citizens to own and took them out of uh, circulation. I bet you they're in the vaults of uh, Wells and Chase and uh, a bank of the, uh, you know, um, America. Yeah, I bet you they're in their vaults. So, yeah, 26. And I will restore thy judges as at the first and thy counselors as at the beginning, afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. Verse 28. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together, and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. They're going to be destroyed. That will be a glorious day. Verse 29. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which ye have desired. Uh, if you don't know what they're talking about here, they're talking about witchcraft. Um, the two sacred trees that I know of in witchcraft and Satanism is the oak, because it's strong, and the holly. Hollywood. Hmm. Guess what they make magic wands out of? Holly. Yeah. How do I know all this stuff? Well, let me tell you, big dog. Um, when I first came to the Lord, I used to go to my New Age bookstore where it had a special room with Satanism. And I was a baby Christian, and I went to that place, and I studied the occult from their books. I even asked the Lord, please protect me. But I had a desire to know what they taught so that when I saw it in the churches, I would know what it was. So when you see somebody running around with a red string around their wrist, guess what? They are... Well, let's just say their Lord is not the Lord Jesus Christ. They have another Lord. The great red dragon of uh, 
I think it's Revelation 12. Yeah. Called the devil and Satan. Verse 29. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which ye have desired. See, the witches would uh, worship their little things under the oaks. And ye shall be confounded for the gardens that ye have chosen. For ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth. Remember in the fall, the oak leaves fall? Oh yeah. That's what's going to happen to all these people that worship nature, nature lovers, nature worshipers, the New Agers, and the witches. They're going to be like the oak leaves in the fall. They're just going to fall down to the ground. For ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water. What happens if a garden has no water? Everything dries up and dies, right? Remember, Jesus said he is the living water. That's right. Without the living water, you are dead. Verse 31. And the strong shall be as tow, and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. What do you think they're talking about here? Burning. They're talking about the lake of fire, people. They're going to burn. Oh, yeah. Wow, I can't believe it. I've only gotten Isaiah, and I, I'm already almost an hour into the study. Woo, dog. Well, I guess we're going to do a part two, and we're going to uh, do, 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 do. We're going to go to the next book we're going to look at will be the book of Daniel. Chapter 7, chapters 11, and 12. Daniel has a lot of prophecy in it. And Daniel's a fairly hard book. I wish I understood it better, but I don't. But the, the Bible declares that in the latter days, in the end times, that the words of Daniel, well, they said that the words of Daniel would, would be uh, sealed until the end, or the latter days, or, you know, you get the idea, right? Uh, in the end times, the book of Daniel should be revealed. It'll become more apparent. And the book of Daniel ties right into the book of Revelation. So, like I say, the Bible is a seamless book. Uh, so many things tie into each other. It's just absolutely amazing. I mean, it's like every time I read the Bible, I find something new that I didn't know before. And, uh, and people, if you really, really, really want to Learn the Bible quickly. Get the Bible on audio. You can get it in an MP4 or you, you can get it in CD. Uh, even Amazon sells it. Uh, the entire Bible on CD or MP3, uh, it's about $85 delivered. It's under 100 Or you can get the New Testament for about $20 or $25. Or you can send me a message um and i've got um the bible parts i've got the minor prophets and the new testament and i could send it to you you know but i like alexander scorby he's got a great voice s-c-o-u-r-b-y and um from I heard, I don't know how true it is, but I heard that uh, they had hired him to read the entire Bible, and he had become a believer after reading it. I don't know how true that is, but I tell you what, to me, I, I feel power in that his voice. I really do. So, do with that information what you will, and... Um, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. We'll be, uh, I'll be back as soon as I can. Um, like I say, I went back to work full time, and it's it's uh, harder for me to find time to do these Bible studies. But I got fifteen hundred plus old Bible studies. You know, 
people let me tell you there's a lot of information there and like I say send me a, a, a USB drive or an SD card I'll put everything together that I've got I've got a lot of medical information too from National Institute of Health and the CDC and all kinds of places on various topics and I'll send it out and you know basically 10 years of Bible studies that I'm willing to share for basically free I'll even pay the postage so and oh by the way somebody sent me a message and uh, about Ruth being a Moabite write me write me and, and get my email address and I will send you some studies proving that she was a problem she was an Israelite living in Moab you know Simon in the New Testament was called a Canaanite he wasn't a Canaanite by blood he lived in the land of Canaan so he was called a Canaanite you know sometimes people were called by the geographical area that they lived in so keep that in mind all right well all this is part one of white all blessings praise glory and honor in Jesus precious name amen <laughs>